And at the time, um, this was an opportunity for me to sort of use some of my skills and do something good. Um, so I had a chance to work in this Fort Mackay. Now, Fort Mackay is about a 40 minute drive north of Fort McMurray. Uh, and this is really the, the heart of the oil sands. Uh, the first time I did the drive from Fort McMurray to Fort Mackay, it was sort of an eye-opening experience. Uh, Fort McMurray is sort of a typical city. There's a Tim Hortons where you can get your Timmy's coffee, which all Canadians love. Uh, very typical, you drive north and you're suddenly surrounded by endless forests, beautiful, amazing forests on the highway. And as you get closer, you start seeing big signs for Sincrude and there's a wild buffalo herd. This is not a natural buffalo herd. This is something that Sincrude has put there. Um, and it's beautiful nonetheless. Then at some point, your nostrils and your ears start being assaulted. Um, you start smelling bitumen, burning bitumen, which is the kind of oil that is used up in this area. And then you start hearing these little tiny popping sounds from all around. It sounds like guns going off. Then you drive by these enormous oil camps where all of these workers from all across Canada are working. So there's thousands and thousands of typically young men working in these camps. And then after you get past that, you start seeing some of the giant industrial um, buildings that are going through. For those that don't know, the oil sands is sort of, um, it's unlike a lot of other kinds of oil that you get in the world where it's actually mixed in with the dirt, the soil. So the process is really intensive to sort of remove the oil and the sand and you get these massive tailing ponds. And these at first look quite beautiful. They're these big shiny lakes of stuff, but you realize that they go on forever. They're toxic. And that popping sound I was telling you about earlier, that is actually cannons that are placed around the outside of these tailing ponds. So wildlife doesn't land in. So obviously um, that is not gonna be a great photo op. I'm, I'm a, a bit of a fan of science fiction and um, it is quite a surreal. It feels like you're going through a science fiction movie. Sorry, I can't move on. I've got a message from Zoom. Just one moment, everybody. Small technical problem here. Uh, sorry. Give me one second. I'm just going to turn off the PowerPoint for one moment, if I can. Zoom is telling me that the video is being recorded, so I can't. We can we can turn the recording off, uh, Josh. Well, I think no, okay. it, it, we're good to go now. Okay. Sorry, I just couldn't uh, I couldn't change for some reason. Okay, no worries. This picture here, you can see me in the bottom corner. Uh, that is the kind of dump trucks that they use to get this oil sand out. Uh, I'm about six feet tall. So the tire itself is at least twice my size, which gives you a bit of an idea of what it sort of looks like over there. Um, and then these were some pictures that I took. I had a quite a rudimentary um, digital camera at the time. And this is what I drove through every single day to get to Fort Mackay. Um, you can see there's a lot of pollution, it's smoggy. Uh, to give you an idea, the, the picture on the right-hand side of that huge crane looking thing, uh, it is unbelievably massive. Uh, it is what's filling up those dump trucks. So that gives you a sense of the scale of the project that's happening in that area of Canada. Now, I wasn't Aboriginal at the time. Uh, I'm still not Aboriginal. What that meant was I, I wasn't allowed to stay in the community. So they put me in the oil camp, which is a whole other lecture because that was such a wild experience. Um, but basically what that meant is every day I drove through the tailing ponds and this industrial site um, to get from where I slept to the community of Fort Mackay. So it was really quite an unreal experience. And what's even stranger about it is that it became normalized to me. The smell started to disappear. The popping sound started to disappear. Now, the people of Mackay um, were an incredible bunch of people. And 
they are completely surrounded. So this was treaty land that they were given uh, way before oil sands development and the oil sands developed all the way around them. Now, the people of Mackay, if we want to talk about the economics of it, um, they were quite smart. They had agreements with the oil companies. They even started their own oil company. And that meant that there were jobs and stuff in the community. And the community was fairly well off because they could develop some of this on their own. Of course, traditional ways of life, uh, hunting and fishing, uh, they use the Athabasca River quite often to fish. They use the forest around it to hunt. And basically this changed the way that they lived entirely. Uh, this is an image that I, I took. Uh, I'm still good friends with several people in the photo. Uh, we went into Canada Day cere uh, celebrations in um, Fort McMurray on this occasion. And uh, some of the, the people from the community, they danced and did some traditional um, singing, which was a really, really exciting opportunity. Um, but the people there, they told me about how challenging this was being surrounded by the oil sands and then also how much of an opportunity it was for many people. Uh, unlike a lot of other reservations across Canada, Mackay was quite well off because they had access to this. So socially and traditionally, this became a, an enormous challenge for them, but economically, this was quite good. Environmentally, there was a lot of talk whether we should eat what we've hunted, what we should eat, what we fish. So it was a tremendously challenging and interesting opportunity, but laced with a lot of difficulty and challenge. So this learning experience for me was short. It was only three months, but it struck me about these impacts that the oil has and the stark contrast I had of myself as this proud Albertan growing up with the Edmonton Oilers and paychecks from our premier. The next experience that I had was in China uh, where this was an eye-opening experience for me. Um, before China, I did my MA in educational management and did a Cambridge Delta in Turkey. And my wife and I, uh, at the time, we wanted to experience something else. And there was a British university, the first British university that was built in China called uh, University of Nottingham, Ningbo, China, related directly with University of Nottingham in the UK. And it was a tremendous professional cultural opportunity for us. It was also a great economic opportunity. I had some student loans from my Canadian undergrad that we could pay off. So this is where we lived in the city of Ningbo. And if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see sort of a golden building. Um, we lived on the 38th floor of that building. Now, what was really remarkable was about five years before we came, everything that you see in this picture was essentially rice paddies. Uh, it, this, this city did not exist. And what was incredible for us was we watched the city develop all around us as we were there. So we watched skyscrapers being built right next to us in real time. And we were only there for about three years, but the, the way our lives changed and what happened around us was sort of unreal. They built a city, felt like the downtown of Calgary where I'm from in five years which was sort of mind blowing. Uh, this here was the view of our apartment and you can see the beautiful skyscrapers at night on the left-hand side. And then during the day, the construction and things happening all around us. Uh, the enormous pace of China growth, uh, China's growth was spectacular in so many different ways, but as you know, um, it comes with enormous costs as well. Uh, so for example, we watched a wet market be taken down overnight and a four lane bridge open up almost overnight. We watched an amusement park uh, replace an entire rice paddy and farmland, you know, over sort of the six months and towards the end when we were leaving. Uh, it really is incredible. And of course, uh, something that I'm quite interested in now is air quality. 
And air quality was quite devastating in many, many, many ways. Uh, this is an image from our area. There are lots of buildings sort of all around and you can see the haze in the sky. And this was actually a relatively good day. Um, if, if you're familiar with sort of an air quality index, it measures particulate matter, uh, PM 2.5, PM 10. And there's a scale that goes from sort of zero to 400. Uh, a typical day in Kobe, where I live now in Japan, is around 30, which uh, by the index standards, that means you can go running and go play outside. There's no real worries. When it gets closer to 100, they say that you shouldn't exercise outdoors. Uh, you should start wearing a mask over 100. And then 200 to 400, it's sort of danger zone. And a typical day in China was anywhere between 80 to 120. So we got quite used to wearing masks um, almost every single day. And the picture I showed you before, uh, I'll just zip back here really quickly, that skyscraper on the left-hand side, some mornings we would wake up and you couldn't even see the skyscraper because the sky was so dark. Um, so it was enormous. One of the things I realized, obviously, is that as a Canadian, uh, I, I took the air that I breathed for granted. Um, I, I was also very lucky because I had this awareness of the air pollution and the different things around us, and I could afford a good mask. And I, you know, us and the colleagues at UNNC, we would talk about this quite often and try to stay as healthy as we could in the circumstances. But I don't recall seeing many Chinese people, local people around us wearing masks. Uh, in fact, I can only remember a couple of my Chinese colleagues at work wearing masks. And this tremendous growth comes with, there's sort of a, a strange feeling for me that most people aren't aware of what's happening around them. And there is going to be huge environmental and health impacts, which we're already sort of seeing. So China, this miracle of economic growth, pulling billions of people out of poverty and by a lot of the stories that our, our Chinese friends told us, our students told us, you know, their lives are so much better than they were 10, 15 years ago. They can afford a cup, cup of coffee where before that was sort of a dream, but at the same time, um, these environmental and health impacts are devastating for a community of people. Now, uh, Aaron Strybe, one of the founders of Eco Linguistics, um, and there, there's a link if you're interested on the, the handout at the end. He talks about the secret reservoir of values inherent in the stories we tell and how challenging it is to, to change these stories and the inherent values for individuals, communities, cultures, and even entire nations. Here, I want to emphasize my transition a little bit uh, and remind you of the students that we have. This is a picture of me when I was 19. This is before I got a chance to see the oil sands in person, work with the people of Mackay, see China. Uh, I was very, very excited about my hockey teams. And I told myself stories about what I wanted to be. Uh, this was a shoe store that I worked for. And I thought I, that was what my future career was going to be at the time. Um, our students are similar. Our students have stories about where they live, where they exist, and the values and beliefs that they have. And our jobs as educators that are, are very, very concerned about some of these major global problems is to challenge our students, their stories that they tell themselves in, in very, very important ways. So these learning experiences and their impact on my values as a person, my beliefs about the world around me, and my ability to communicate them and act in the world to live up to these values is essential. This strikes at the very heart of this field that I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about today called Language Education for Sustainable Development, or LESD. The world faces tremendous challenges like climate change. And in order to be able to face these issues, an appreciation of the depth and complexity and the interconnectedness of these issues is necessary and 
is quite motivating and interesting for our students. So what is LESD? Essentially, it's a combination of language teaching and the subsets that you see there on the board. So EFL, EAP, CLIL, um, some of you might be familiar with some of those or be in those types of fields. And also education or sustainability education, which is the field of education for sustainable development, which uh, Dr. Singer mentioned earlier, environmental literacy, sustainable development, environmental education. And it's trying to find ways in between these two uh, where they can communicate. Um, it's also, I, I envision LESD as sort of a, uh, if you will, a walled garden where practitioners can practice and experiment and share ideas with each other on how to do this better. Now, it arose out of two areas that started to really bother me as a language educator many, many years ago. Firstly, we live in a world for better or for worse that is dominated by English. Now, I don't want to get into a conversation about cultural or uh, language uh, imperialism. Uh, uh, I pulled your changes, that's yeah. no problem. Hi, everybody. That sounds like somebody's uh, mic. Okay, that's better. Thank you. Um, the, the, the reality for many of our students is that language, English, is the language of international politics, governing bodies like the United Nations. And in these fields, they need English or another commonly used language to communicate. Now, LESC does not really care about what language students learn, and it will be necessary to shift to another language if that becomes dominant on the landscape. But LESD does want our students to have an impact. Um, impact at the moment, if you're an English teacher, for example, or a Japanese teacher, this is not necessarily a goal that's built into what we do. But in LESD, I strongly believe that we want our students to do something with the language. And this means being able to communicate their ideas, their cultural values more broadly, and then also be able to experience other cultures and bring those ideas back with them. So communication is a major, major, major part of it. So the first goal is providing tools to our students so that they can communicate their ideas broadly. Now, secondly, when we learn languages with the only goal of language proficiency, the content does not really matter. So at the end of the day, uh, here in, in Japan, for example, we spend huge amounts of resources and time teaching English to our students. Uh, the government spends an enormous amount of time starting that process in elementary school. And it's really to get language proficiency up, but the content is sort of secondary. It's not the primary, it's, it's actually used as an afterthought. And personally, I think that, that the content should share that with the goal of language proficiency. If you pick up any language textbook, you'll notice that there's a bunch of different themes and it's typically done um, over a single lesson. So for example, there will be a chapter in a textbook that's dedicated to climate change. And then the next chapter is dedicated to how to survive at an airport. And that climate change chapter is useful and interesting, but it gets cut off completely. Um, so, and, and it's not interconnected with any of the other chapters in the textbook. And that means that there's not opportunities for scaffolding and other types of things. So I started thinking a lot about the content that we use and the second goal is to facilitate an understanding of the complexity and interrelatedness of challenging global issues for our students. Now, how does this work? So let's, let's talk a little bit about this, um, these two separate goals of LESD. So remember language education by itself, the primary goal is language proficiency. I'm, I'm uh, LESD is looking at sharing those goals. So the content is also as important as language proficiency. If we want to, for example, 
teach our students about recycling. Uh, if you're an economics professor, you might start by looking at the costs and benefits of recycling for an individual, a community, a city, or a nation, for instance. You may use case studies of countries that have robust recycling programs compared to other countries that don't. If you are a social scientist, maybe you're interested in the waste produced generally by society and the ills that this potentially can cause. Maybe your focus is on social aspects uh, with case studies about people who work in waste management industry or that live close by waste disposal sites and are negatively affected. If you're an environmental scientist or in, in the environmental sciences, maybe you are going to be concerned about the impact of waste disposal and its connections with uh, human or other life forms. You may show your class case studies of where soil has been degraded to the point that it is no longer fertile or groundwater that's contaminated by these disposal sites and how this compares to communities where waste is not recycled, eliminated or minimized in any way. So no matter what your discipline that you come from, the benefits of recycling are obviously well established and ideally your students would be able to better understand the situation from the lessons or courses that you're teaching on this topic. When I was a young man, recycling was a nice lesson in the Canadian education system, but I really didn't see that happening in my community. My parents didn't recycle, my school didn't really recycle. And so the story that I started telling about recycling was that it wasn't very important. Your students have similar stories. So we need to make these connections much more deeply. We need to understand the process of getting someone who believes recycling is unimportant to someone who thinks that it is important. Now, admittedly, I used to believe that I could give my students a single lesson on recycling, maybe mixed in with some English objectives, and my students would magically recycle at the end of the lesson I dust off my hands, I get to go home at the end of the night and my work is done. But this uh, is quite naive. What actually happens in our brains is very, very, very complex, very, very dynamic. And again, it takes a long, long, long time. So let me just give you uh, this values, beliefs, norms model. And this really falls at the heart of what what language education for sustainable development is. Now, I'm, I'm gonna go through it relatively quickly. If there's questions at the end, uh, please let me know. There's also going to be some references to this if you wanna learn more in the handout at the end. But essentially, what we want is, at the end of the day, we want people to recycle, for example. So this is, in this model of environmental behavior, we say it's pro-environmental behaviors or PEVs. That's the end result. To get there, we have a whole bunch of different steps that have to take place. Now, the first of these um, is what we call the new ecological paradigm. This was something, excuse me, that was proposed by Stern and then sort of uh, refined by Dunlop and Van Leer. And basically, what we have here is we have three ways of understanding yourself in the world. The biospheric, how you see yourself in the environment, egoistic, how you yourself view yourself, and then what you think you can give back, which is the altruistic. And that makes up your new ecological paradigm or the NEP, for example. Now, to get a student to really seriously start thinking about it, right? Imagine myself as a 20 year old, Okay, or your students as young 18, 19, 20 year olds, young adults, right? They have a story and a view of the way that they think about recycling, for example. What we need to do in the classroom is we need to start um, raising the awareness of the consequences of recycling, right? So if you have a bottle, we have to start thinking about what happens if you don't throw it in the proper receptacle. 
right? Uh, what happens to it? Does it get swept into the ocean? How does that affect the life in the ocean? Those types of things. So that is the first step. And sorry, I should mention as well that this is you have to think about it like a hierarchy. There's sort of these steps, all of these steps you have to go through before you can actually get uh, the behavior to happen in the real world. The next step, uh, hang on one second here. The next step is what we call ascription of responsibility. So again, you have a bottle and uh, you recycle it, right? It, are you responsible for that recycling program? Is it another organization that's responsible for it? Is it a government policy that's responsible for it? Maybe it's Coca-Cola that produced that bottle, right? Are they responsible for the plastic in that bottle? So we start thinking about who is actually responsible for these things that we have. Now we start challenging these values and beliefs around a, something that seems very simple, recycling. The last step is what we call personal norming. And this is where we're asking students to actually start saying what they want to do in the world. This doesn't mean that they're going to do it. So for example, um, you know, saying something like, my school currently doesn't have a robust recycling program. I want them to have a recycling program right, or showing interest in improving the recycling programs that are already in place, or something like, uh, I want to start recycling at home. So saying these types of things is the step right before you actually do something in the real world. Now, saying those things doesn't mean that they're actually going to do it. So this process, you have to think of it like an evolution or a hierarchy of things that are happening behind our brains. And again, we don't know exactly what's happening in our brains, but this is sort of a really good model that's been tried and true in terms of uh, environmental behavior. And this is very, very difficult to do. So again, the one-off lesson on climate change is not enough. The one-off lesson on recycling is not enough. We need to have several instances where the students um, engage with these types of topics. So we've got a series of our young students here and LESD, the idea here is that we're going to challenge these values, beliefs, and norms so that hopefully at some future time, they change their behaviors. And we also want them to be proficient language users because we want them to be able to communicate broadly, right? To tap into some of these really, really important organizations like the United Nations, tap into academia, right? And the huge amount of literature that's available to them in English or whatever other language that they have access to. So LESD sort of takes them through these steps, challenging their values, beliefs, and norms. And then uh, we hope that some future time they're gonna be able to um, act in the world in a way that is in line with these beliefs and values. Another way to think about this, another model um, that I've started developing, you'll notice the little gold triangles at the bottom. One side is sort of the content, and I'll talk about this a little bit, but I, the sustainable development goals are a really good place to start with meaningful content. Language education discipline has done a tremendous job over the last 20 or 30 years in improving language proficiency. So we definitely want that to continue and we wanna use those important ideas and concepts and techniques that have been developed in language education to continue doing this. Now, what we want is um, this idea of education for sustainable development, which is quite a developed field in uh, environmental education. And this is the challenging of those values, beliefs and norms. And then at some future time, we hope that they're going to do actual things in the real world. So if we look at that values, beliefs, and norms model from before, we can see that golden area is that first section where that's basically the new ecological paradigm, the story that our students are telling themselves now. And we have to take them through this journey, this evolution of ways of thinking about these things um, by 
trying to get them to think carefully about this awareness of consequences, this ascription of responsibility, and then being able to actually communicate and say what they want to do in the real world. And that will eventually take us and lead us into these environmental behaviors that we want to be seen. Now, the sustainable development goals, um, if you live here in Japan, you've probably seen these. Uh, you can see them on the Hankyu train. I see them all the time on posters. Um, they're, they're quite out there. The idea of these goals is they're a blueprint to achieve a better and most, more sustainable future for all. And they address global challenges we face, including poverty, inequality, climate change, environmental degradation, and so on. They're called goals because by 2030, there's a set of goals that have been agreed on by several different countries around the world. And they're not perfect. And there is some controversy about the way that they're set up, but they are an excellent template to start, right? This represents some of the biggest challenges we have in the world. And one of the, the key themes of this is climate change. You'll notice that it's in sustainable, um, it's SDG 13 in the picture here in the, the bottom left-hand corner. But climate change is something that you can see in almost every single other sustainable development goal, right? Um, once we start having heat waves, we're going to have problems with access to clean water. Sanitation could become a problem. So it links in with SDG 6, for example. Gender equality is another one that doesn't seem like it would go very, very easily together, but there's a lot of research that shows that it does, right? When you start empowering women and families, they are able to educate their sons and daughters in ways that um, help to fight and promote um, better ways of being in the world, right? Uh, to prevent climate change. So throughout this presentation, I've been weaving in these sort of economic, social, and environmental tensions. Um, I don't wanna go into a lot of detail about what climate change is, because I think everyone is aware. But these narratives, um, are really, really important ways to understand our students. And by giving them this meaningful content through the sustainable development goals, students can start seeing these tensions, seeing how they're interconnected and interdisciplinary, and they can start thinking about ways that they can be part of the solutions for the future. Um, I listened to a, an interesting podcast yesterday. It was talking about this latest generation um, that is dealing with the pandemic and they're dealing with climate change and now they're dealing with a horrible war in Russia. And they're going to be asking themselves about the sources of the energy that we're getting and how this has both led to the climate crisis, which they face, if, um, which they will face the consequences of if they haven't already, and how this energy has enriched and empowered a Russian dictator. The SDGs offer templates and really nice ways to sort of weave in and, and deal with these complex issues. Uh, a lot of people, and this is me as well, before I used to shy away from this complexity, but in fact, I have used it in my classroom and it is a powerful way for uh, motivating students and getting them interested in this. And of course, again, we want our students at some future time to understand these ideas, be able to communicate them broadly. And this is what's going to build us more resilient societies in the future and hopefully avoid future wars. Um, so how do we do this? Um, one of the things that I've really tried to do is I've tried to bridge education for sustainable development or environmental education and then language education. Um, and so if you are a practitioner of either or, you're going to see a lot of familiar words and ideas here. There is a framework that I've developed called SCOPE. Um, and it is a really powerful way to start re-envisioning what you do in the classroom. So it starts off with being student-centered. So empowering students through student-led research, critical thinking. Um, if you're a language practitioner or an educational list, you will have seen critical thinking a million times. If you're an environmental educationalist, challenging the values, beliefs, and norms of our students, these two things are very, very similar. 
offering feedback, enabling or providing students with different templates to do self-feedback, peer feedback, and teacher feedback is very important. Practicing and demonstrating knowledge. Once students have learned about something, whatever that might be, recycling or an area of climate change or an area of gender equality, giving them the opportunity to practice and demonstrate this knowledge, um, PowerPoints, poster presentations. And then the last part is to educate others. And this is, I think, uh, a very, very important part that we miss out on oftentimes in our teaching practices. But giving students additional opportunities, whether that is um, our students are very savvy with social media, possibly giving a presentation to another class or uh, a lecture at lunch for other students. Now, just to go into a little bit more detail, um, I've been working on this in several different cases. I worked at um, Kwansai Gakuen University where I started, I taught an environmental ethics course and I started developing these ideas which got fed into my dissertation. Um, here, in this case, the students were able to think about something that, that uh, they chose the topic of their presentation. They had to do a poster presentation and then they had to interview someone in the community and give a final presentation as a group. Uh, one of the students that I remember very well, she worked for a bread company in Osaka and the bread company was throwing out tons of waste at the end of the day. So she was curious, where does this waste go? Why aren't we using more of this waste? And it was a powerful way for her to get excited and motivated. The other students were fascinated by it and were drawn into it. And it was an incredible opportunity. So the students, student-centeredness, uh, we talk about it a lot in a lot of different educational contexts, but it is a powerful way for students to engage with this material. Critical thinking, uh, I've talked a lot about this values, beliefs, and norms, sorry, uh, values and beliefs and norms model, right? To get students to actually do something at some future time, we have to push them through this evolution. And so we need as many instances as they can to interact and to think about these issues in deeper ways. Offering feedback, um, this is one that students really appreciate. When they're developing their ideas about something, oftentimes at the beginning, uh, and this is a normal process for every human being, but the ideas are quite simple. We have simple cause and effect relationships that, that don't always show the nuance. So having opportunities for feedback and to explore these ideas in more depth is powerful, right? We start developing these bigger networks of ideas and these interconnected ideas that are much uh, more helpful in the way the world actually works. Practicing and demonstrating knowledge. Um, I've started sort of developing these, these feedback loops where again, a student takes a simple idea, um, let's say food waste in Japan, and they're offered an opportunity to research it, they present, and then this feedback loop kicks in. Students ask questions, teachers ask questions, right? And then as long as they have another opportunity to present, um, the more opportunities they have to present, the more powerful those ideas become, right? The more opportunities they have sort of rub up against those tensions and present in different ways. And then lastly is educate others. Um, I work at uh, Konan University and we have Pecha Kucha Night. If you've not heard of Pecha Kucha, it's a worldwide organization. It was started originally in Japan, but it is a wonderful template for giving students a stage to present more widely. And a lot of my students that I've done Model United Nations with or environmental ethics or business ethics, um, or even uh, there's a sustainable development course that we teach um, called Global Challenges. And it's a really nice opportunity for students to present these ideas, especially after they've gone through these loops of feedback, they've gone through these loops of presenting and educating others. Uh, and this gives them a really wonderful template to further refine those ideas. So in closing, this scope framework uh, is a very, very powerful way to sort of start the process of implementing LESD into your classroom. Um, now, of course, not everyone has the privilege of doing huge course-wide or curriculum-wide changes, but starting somewhere, right, uh, what, what I would call a low LESD, right, 
starting to think about how you can change small things in the classroom. Even if you're using a textbook and you've got a chapter on climate change, there's ways that you can do that one chapter uh, that is much more interesting for students by keeping the scope framework in mind. And then hopefully being able to try to tie it in or link it to other chapters as well. Those become very powerful. And if you are in a privileged position where you control a course or a set of curriculum, you can do much more deeper dives with a scope framework where you can really, really integrate these things and something that I call high LESD. One of the things, uh, a couple of sort of final thoughts, this transition from transmissive teaching, right, where it's student led, um, teacher says something, student takes it in, but into transformative learning, where we give the students an opportunity to research things that they're interested in, and also things that are meaningful to them, such as the sustainable development goals. Uh, these are things that they will deal with in their lives. They will be impacted by climate change, uh, no matter where they are in the world. And so this transformative type of teaching through using a scope framework is very, very, very powerful. And of course, using meaningful content and challenging the students' values, beliefs, and norms about the narratives that they tell themselves. This is essential and very, very important part of being able to transform the students. Our students are gonna be dealing with lots of challenges in their lifetimes. I think about myself when I was 20 and what I understood about the world, um, I look at my students and they're, they're in a, a very difficult position. Climate change was happening when I was young, uh, almost 20 years ago, but it wasn't as understood and we weren't seeing the impacts as dramatically as we are today. And they're also dealing with a pandemic, which is gonna have consequences, a globalizing world, right? Poverty and inequality, and then climate change. So really trying to give our students the tools to communicate and our students content that is meaningful to them so that they can express these ideas in a broader sense. To close, there's something I've been thinking about quite a lot lately. Um, and it, this comes from computer science in general, but the idea is that each of us can be sort of a node in a larger network. So if you think about yourself, you are that little green dot. And let's say that you do a lesson or two and you try to integrate the scope framework, you start making connections to broader ideas for the students. Now, not all of us can control an entire curriculum, but the more people that are doing this, the more opportunities students have to interact with these ideas, right? The more that they hear about the sustainable development goals, whether that's in my language class or in the professor's economics class, all of those things, every single moment, we start making deeper connections with the material. So somebody, for example, I teach about climate change, somebody teaches about peace and justice and how a world that, that is, is facing climate change is going to be less peaceful, right? There's more opportunities for war. Those connections are powerful. Somebody else talks about responsible consumption, right? Fast fashion, for example. Somebody else talks about quality education, how these things intercede, clean water and sanitation, and reduce inequalities. And what you start getting is a picture of these interconnections. You do your small part, and as long as other people are also talking about sustainable development goals and students are bumping up against these tensions, they're going to start creating these more complex and nuanced understandings of these problems. And that's going to make them a powerful force in the future for resiliency. So again, using the sustainable development goals as meaningful content and doing what we do really well in the language classroom uh, together, this is a powerful force. So uh, thank you very, very, very much. Uh, I'll end there for now. What I will do is uh, very, very shortly, I will send out the, um, I've got a handout and on the handout is a QR code for the feedback form. Uh, if you want, you can simply take your phone right now and snap a picture uh, or 
of the QR code and it will take you to a Google form. If you're interested in learning more in the future, um, that is available to you. And right now in the chat room, I will send everyone the handout. Uh, it has some of the links and things that I've talked about today. So please uh, download that from the chat room shortly. And of course, uh, we now have some time for some questions. Um, so if anybody has any ones, I think we've still got about 15 more minutes. So I'll pass it on to um, Singer Sensei. Okay, thank you so much, Joshua. I think, yeah, your talk raised, hopefully raised lots of questions and, and helped us to try and, and think about uh, how we might revise our approach in, in the classroom um, in order to apply some of these principles. Um, I think, let's see, yeah, we have some, I'm looking at the, at the chat room and uh, we've got some uh, comments, no questions at the moment. Um, if you have a question, uh, you are welcome to, to write it in the chat room or else you can just um, use the, uh, the hands up emoji and, and we will, or Joshua Pub will catch you there. Um, while we're waiting, maybe I can just uh, throw out a question and get people started thinking. I, I would also just say, uh, I'd love to see people's faces too. I know a lot of people have uh, traveled a long way. So if you guys don't mind turning on your cameras, if it's possible, that would be wonderful to see everyone. Uh, and a huge thank you to those people that uh, have woken up very early in other countries to come. Thank you very much. Definitely. Okay, so let's see. Um, I have one question, which is, you know, since you are from uh, language, the language education field, um, and probably a lot of our participants today are also teaching um, foreign languages. In For many people, um, you are asked to use a particular textbook um, and the curriculum is perhaps also pretty much fixed. Um, so even if you know, your ideas are very exciting, people would like to apply them, how exactly can they do that given these kind of constraints? Thank you. Yeah, it's, it, it, that's a, something that I've been struggling with for a very, very long time. Um, in the early days, when, when I first started teaching, of course, I taught mostly using textbooks in some of the, the earlier lessons that I did. I, I started off in South Korea, for example, and we relied very heavily on those textbooks. And I didn't know what to do at the time. Like I said, I give a lesson on recycling and I felt like the students would just recycle afterward. I know that's not true now. Um, but what you can do is start looking for ways to connect ideas with other parts of that textbook. Um, very often, again, with textbooks, this is something I, I did a little bit of research on in my dissertation, but textbooks do a very bad way of sort of saying, okay, today we're gonna talk about Recycling, we talk about recycling, we go through the, the lecture, they ask you a quick question, uh, you know, do you think recycling is important? And students say, you know, they get into groups, they discuss it, and then that's it. The next day they come into class and it's a completely different day we're talking about going to the airport, but trying to make connections, right? So we can make connections with recycling and airports, climate change and airports. So trying to find ways that we can figure out uh, ways that, that intercede and interconnect these ideas. We also oftentimes as language teachers, we do have control over some of the homework that we give our students, right? So there's ways that we can start making that a little bit more interesting. And also the values, beliefs and norms model that I showed you earlier, we really need students to start thinking about um, who's responsible for some of the things that are happening in the world, right? Um, trying to touch on some of those middle parts, right? The awareness of consequences, how to personal norm. So there is lots of little things that we can do in the classroom. And of course, if you're in a privileged position to change an entire course or curriculum, there's lots of different ways that we can change that from a more top-down level. Um, looking at different ways to have students present more often, looking for more ways for feedback, looking for more ways that we can make it more student-centered. So the more that we can do that, I think is, is quite a powerful thing. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so we'd, like, we'd love to hear some more questions from people. 
Okay, I think Christine, you have a question. Uh, yeah, so I was I was lucky enough this past semester to have an entire English department class to teach around the sustainable development goals. You know, we spent like one goal per week, and it was it was pretty interesting, as you might imagine. And you mentioned in your your lecture about the importance of feedback, and that is something that I found kind of difficult. Uh, so to give an example for their for their midterm project, I had them you know come in and do a presentation about uh, some kind of project that that somebody had done in service of the SDGs. So for for my classes, we had been going over all oh, this UN project and this NGO project, and mine most of mine came in with like. Uh, corporate sustainable or corporate social responsibility type of projects, which to me, because I have the background, they, they struck me as very greenwashy. <laughs> but, you know, I, I was keeping in mind that, you know, the, these guys are not in the environmental engineering department, they're English majors, and I don't want to be a bummer. I don't want to rain on the parade, as it were. So something I find really challenging with this is finding that balance between, you know, being inspirational, not being a bummer, but also being accurate. And so I, I wonder what, what are your thoughts about that? Um, I, like you, I've struggled with a lot of the same. <laughs> you know, we, we oftentimes, if you've been in this field for a while and you're interested and excited about it, right, you've made a lot of those, you know, like the, the node I showed earlier, that network, you've made all these connections, right? Sure. And it's quite complex and dynamic. And you want to share that immediately with your students. But oftentimes they're not quite there yet. They're still trying to figure out how to research on Google or, um, you know, read that article that you've you've already passed on that might be too long for them. So trying to find ways that that you can sort of bridge those gaps, get them excited about those ideas. But uh, yeah, we it, it's it's quite a balancing act. I guess it, it depends on your students, your classroom. Sometimes I've found that if I've got a student that you know, sometimes you see those light bulbs go on. I pull them aside after class or before class and sort of say, hey, if you're interested, here's something else, right? Check out this website, check out. And that's a way to sort of offer students um, pathways sort of individually, right? Um, but again, I yeah, without knowing more about your students and sort of the feedback cycles that you've got going on, it's a bit more difficult. Um, yeah. One, one small suggestion, I, I've started using Google Forms. This is something I've taken up quite a lot mm -hmm. since the pandemic. And Google Forms uh, is a really nice way to get very quick feedback from students before or after class. Oftentimes it can take five minutes. Um, you give them a QR code, they zip in with their phones. And oftentimes I've found that that is a really nice way for me to sort of just take a temperature of the class. So if you brought up something that's interesting for them or challenging for them, uh, they can write one or two sentences very quickly or even you know, give them a scale of what they thought about that topic. And then it's an opportunity for me the next class, I can read through those comments quickly and then address things generally. Um, and it's a nice way that I can sort of take some feedback from them and then also offer the class some guidance or feedback the next day. So that, that might be a tool or something that you might consider as well. All right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Any other questions? Um, did everybody manage to get the, the handout? Just give me a thumbs up if you got it. Awesome, yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Hi, I, I didn't manage to get the handout, so I'm just wondering if, um... Maybe you could put it again. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's my computer, but it's not downloading for me. And I'd really like to get it because it was a really interesting talk. Thanks, Josh. No, no problem. Um, I'll put my uh, my email in the, um, the chat as well, and you can always zip me an email if um, for some reason you didn't get it. Let me just make sure it's all correct. Yeah, there it is. Okay, Ray, I think has a question. Ray Wiggins. Okay now? 
Yeah, please. Okay. Hi, Josh. Thank you very much. Very hey, Ray. Nice to see you. Thank nice you very much you. for coming. Uh, I've got a question about VBN. Um, you mentioned different places you'd lived and different sort of developments in your awareness, in a way. Um, 20 odd years ago, I lived in Germany. Uh, I lived in Berlin. And in Berlin, you have these like apartment block complexes. And in the center of it, you have a courtyard with like five, six recycling bins. And everyone who lives in that complex will sort their waste. So, you know, you've got food waste, plastic, glass, et cetera, et cetera. So doing a VBN type um, sort of awareness raising with a German student, they already have the knowledge, they already have the awareness and the responsibility because they've been trained to since childhood. Whereas many places, and I'm, I'm guessing from your experience, don't have that awareness and they need you or us as English teachers to help them with that awareness. So my question is, how would that affect the production of materials or classroom activities when you've got wildly different backgrounds in awareness? How do you think that might work? Okay, well, thanks Ray. Are you, you're, you're phoning in from Turkey today, yeah? Yes, I'm in Turkey. I okay. mean, that's an interesting point. I moved from uh, Germany, which has a very high awareness of recycling, to Turkey, which has virtually, or then, no awareness of recycling. It was not uncommon to see someone just throw things out of a car window. Cigarette packets, bottles, anything. I'm sure you know that, yeah? <laughs> well, I, w w one thing that, I mean, this is what uh, I was thinking about when you were talking about Germany. When I first got to Japan seven years ago, uh, for those of us in Japan, we, we have to put everything in separate bags, right? Yeah. So there's a day for plastic, there's a day for cans and bottles, there's a day for paper and burnable and cardboard, et cetera, right? And I thought, this is brilliant. This is really, really an amazing system. But then when you start diving a little bit deeper, you realize that all of those bottles that you put in that nice bag and put it on the curb, uh, there's something like 50% of those bottles that are actually just incinerated. Mm -hmm. And so the, the point being is, I, I don't know what the program Germany has or what city you lived in, but very, very often when you start digging a little bit deeper, you start learning about sort of uh, the, how complex and nuanced these issues actually are. And that's really rich for our students to sort of explore and to understand. Mm -hmm. um, it's same with like food waste here in Japan, there's very strict laws about how to deal with food waste, right? And you know, the, my students were asking questions about, well, why can't we give that to homeless people, all that food waste? So her, her boss was throwing out bags and bags of bread at the end of the day. And that ended up leading to another project where they started exploring the homeless problem in Japan. Right, which is sort of a secret underground problem um, and how that's dealt with in the society, right? And how those two things sort of intercede. So I guess, I guess the point being is, is you obviously want to organize it and try to get your students in that context involved in any way. But obviously those things that, that sometimes we think are being done under the surface aren't. And those become really rich ways for us to sort of explore and to dig in a little bit deeper and to learn about. I, I don't so know if that answered the question entirely, but. Um, so for teachers then, the implication is that you would always have to be student-centered with your own class. So, so again, that's part of my question. Can you have a sort of bank of materials that would, I mean, you mentioned earlier about course books and we all know they're very generalized to fit in with any culture, but. Right. It, it, would, it puts a lot of work on the teacher, I'm saying, in terms of preparation, busy teachers. I mean, how can you help that? How can you help us, Josh? <laughs> well, that, that, that's a huge... That's a, <laughs> that, that, is, that is actually one of, one of the things that um, I've been trying to develop, I'm writing about right now in this book that I'm, I'm working on. It, th this takes a lot more work, right? Yeah. One, one of the things that's really wonderful is, in, as a language educator, right, we want to scaffold different types of language, whether that's, you know, grammar points or whatnot. And we're always looking for ways to sort of recycle and have our students repeat and understand these things in sort of a more deeper way. Sorry, it sounds like we've got an Amazon package that just arrived. Just one moment here. Um, 
I have lost my train of thought. And, and one of the things that's really nice about the sustainable development goals is because they are interconnected, it does give opportunities for us to recycle those things in mm -hmm. somewhat more naturally, but it's a tremendous amount of work. I'm not going to lie that, that doing this work and doing it well is very, very, very uh, difficult and time consuming. And it's a, a rethinking of the way that we as language teachers sort of think about setting up classrooms. Mm -hmm. Now that's not to say that it's not worth it and there's small things we can do along the way, right? Uh, I oftentimes too, I, I used to think that the, it was my responsibility, there was a huge responsibility just on me to do this stuff because I'm passionate about it, I think it's important. But I started realizing that all of these other teachers are doing it as well, right? And so the small mm -hmm. idea that you yeah. bring up in your classroom, right? So maybe you bring up climate change, somebody else is going to also link with that sustainable development goal, right? So okay. there is yeah. other deeper things. The more people that are around those students that are doing this kind of work, the more instances and more opportunities they get to sort of bump up against these ideas. So again, if, if you can only do a few things, that's, that's great. Uh, I know we're under constraints sometimes by our context, but again, yeah, the, the more that you can do. Hopefully I finish this book sometime in the next two years. And we'll be in touch. <laughs> hopefully and there'll we, be something. We, we, and hopefully you can set up a network then for all teachers to share maybe. Yeah. That would be great. That's that's the idea. Um, great. Thank you, Josh. Anyways, thank, thank, you. thank you very much, Ray. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming in. Avril, I see you've got your hand up. Um, My question was actually about your book because um, I'd like to know more. And I'm just wondering what, you know, when you've just mentioned maybe the next two years. So I was going to ask, when's it coming out? And, and what are you hoping to, to have in it. As, as a full-time teacher, I've, I've realized that it's very hard to write a book and find the time to do it. So it's slowly but surely, I've, I've got about four chapters now. So I'm, I'll, I'll be working hard. And, and certainly if you, um, with the feedback form, uh, if you leave your email address, that's uh, one of the options on there, um, I will certainly be in touch and send out some uh, emails once I have something in hand. But it, it's, it's, I, I do have some publications too on that that are forthcoming that do explore a couple of these ideas in a little bit more depth. I think that almost brings us to the end of the session, unless there's any I, other- I could maybe ask one, one more question, um, sure. which is um, you've explained you know, very eloquently about steps that uh, language teachers can take um to improve the content and, and the approach for environmental studies but what about uh teachers of other from other disciplines and I, just for example let's say i was a teacher of, of art history or a mathematics professor or you know some other discipline that would seem to have um almost nothing to do with climate change or environmental studies as a whole do you have any sort of off the top observations about how we can integrate environmental content into classes like that? Um, so that, that's, that's a great question. And that's something that I've been trying to think a little bit more and I've been trying to talk to people from different fields and see, you know, obviously. Um, so for example, taking art history as an interesting way to look at it. Art history oftentimes maps out the historical periods of time where people have faced tremendous challenges, right? And I think there is um, really, really good opportunities where, for example, people have faced famines, right? This is represented in the art. And we're also facing challenges like that with climate change, right? We start seeing famines in different parts of the world. We start seeing natural disasters in certain parts of the world. And I do think that there are places where we can combine or, or look at ways that these overlap, right? So if we're looking at a famine and the impacts of it through artwork, right? We can start talking about what is the implication for people that are facing famines today, right? And trying to make those connections with what's happening. Um, mathematics is a huge part of climate science for example, right? A lot of these very, very complicated um, analyses of what's actually happening with the climate is done by sophisticated computer algorithms. And I don't think it'd be so much of a stretch for a mathematics professor to start bringing some of those things into the classroom, right? And exploring those with the students. 
Um, again, I guess it would depend on the level of the students and what they're doing, but there is tons of areas for overlap in bringing these things in. I know myself, uh, you develop a course, it's a tremendous amount of work and changing it all the time is very difficult, right? But I think looking at these, these issues, looking at the sustainable development goals and especially what our students are gonna face in their futures, right? It, that extra effort is worth it. So any ways that we can sort of find those places that overlap, intercede, um, I think is a really powerful way to do that kind of work. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, I think we're, we're at um, quarter after five and I'm sure everyone is hungry for some dinner or breakfast or wherever they're coming in from the way the world, uh, wherever in the world that they are. Um, a huge, huge thank you again to everyone that, that came in. Um, please get in touch if you want any of those publications or anything that um, is on that list or anything I can be of any service, I would uh, be happy to help out in any way. Okay, and I and uh, just yeah to wrap up, um, I think uh, many of us have been inspired and and uh, intrigued by your talk today, and we'll um, definitely get in touch with you, Joshua. So I just like to thank you so much for uh, for um, sponsoring this talk, for giving this talk today, um, and uh, if everyone could uh, perhaps use your emoji and. Uh, <laughs> and give Joshua some applause. Thank you so very, very much. Um, and also I would like to thank Aaron Campbell, who's uh, the head of our Department of Global Studies, um, who is helping, who helps set this up and is, has been running all the logistical uh, um, issues. And uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been great. Um, I hope that we have some other talks maybe in the pipeline um, on this upcoming year, and we'll be sure and get to get in touch with you if we do. Um, all right. Well, if there are no other questions, comments that um, need immediate sharing, please do get in touch with Joshua um, in the future if you need to, and, uh, and uh, we will also try and stay in touch with you as well. Thank you so very much. Um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful semester um, or a, a wonderful term um, and a bit of a holiday beforehand. Okay, um, we're going to leave now then. Um, thank you.